Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Committee on Community Resources. Uh, the date today is April 26, 2021. This meeting is at 5 p.m. It's being held virtually. Um, this meeting is being uh, audio and video recorded. And also it's being transcribed as well, right, Laura? Yes. Um, so I'd like to call the meeting to order. And um, Laura, could you take the roll call? Sure. Um, Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Foster, not yet present. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. OK, we have a quorum. And um, the first item on our agenda is public comment. And I see we have a number of people in the room. Um, and that I see one hand raised. Um, so public comment um, is for, for this meeting. Uh, we'll, so we're gonna ask that if, if you want to speak to something that's on the agenda, we are actually gonna have a discussion about those items and, and members of the public are welcome to interact um, with uh, the, the committee, ask us questions, share information with us so that um, uh, if, if you want to comment or be part of those discussions about anything that's on the agenda, I'm going to ask that you hold your comment until we're talking about those items. But in the meantime, if there's any other uh, 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 things that people want to talk about that are not on the agenda, now is the time to raise your hand and, um, and I'll, I'll recognize you. And if you could raise your virtual hand, that would be really helpful. And I'm gonna do a gallery view to see if anybody's raising their hand. No, I just see my friendly faces from, my, from the committee here and, and Carolyn Mish and, um, and I don't see any hands raised. So I'm gonna go to the next thing on the agenda. Um, which is any updates or announcements by committee members? Anybody have anything? Don't have anything for you, Jim. Okay. Uh, there is one thing I want to mention, and I think, it, and Laura brought it to our attention, and I think it relates to one of the topics on the agenda here, it has to do with cell technology, uh, or this one, this item has to do with uh, uh, municipal broadband. Uh, Safe Tech Northampton is holding um, a, uh, a forum at six o'clock today. And I think there's gonna be crossover between that and folks here for the, um, the, the cell tower discussion. And you can find the link to that on Facebook by looking up Safe Tech Northampton. So any other announcements? Oh, Councillor Foster is here. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, Laura was able to pull together the minutes of the previous meeting from January 27th. And I'm wondering and they just went out today, Laura, right? That's correct. Um, and so people are excused if they have not had a chance to look at them quite yet. But um, the so let me ask for a motion to approve the minutes and then we'll discuss that. <clears throat> Move to approve. Second. Thank you. OK, uh, so the minutes were, were sent out today. Uh, did everybody, did folks have a time, a, a chance to look them over yet? Councilor Nash, I have not looked them over. Okay. Neither have I. Okay. So um, then I am going to table approval of these minutes to our next meeting. And thank you, Laura, for pulling them together. Laura. Okay. Next on the agenda, um, we have two zoning items before us related to zero lot line. Uh, one is 21. 217, an ordinance to move zero lot line from section 10.14 to section 6.13. Uh, it was referred to us uh, from city council back on 4 1. 
There's also another item related to this, um, 21218, 20, uh, an ordinance to amend zero lot line section of code referred to us back on 4.1. And um, that I, at this point, I would like to uh, hand the floor to Carolyn Mish with our planning department. And I just wanna frame things here that this is meant to be an informational meeting. Uh, this is, uh, we're, we're not here to deliberate, um, you know, whether we like this or not, or we, we can ask questions, pointed questions if we want to, but it, it's, it's meant to be an informational meeting. And also it's a invitation to the public to uh, engage with us and with the planning department around this, these particular zoning proposals. So, uh, Councillor Jarrett. Uh, thanks, Councillor Nash. Um, so we, will we be voting on a recommendation for, to the council? You know, that's a good question. Um, we probably want to make a recommendation. Um, but um, I, um, but I, I'd like to save that until after the presentation. Right. Great. Okay. And with that, it's Carolyn Mish. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, Councillor. Hello, Councillor Nash, and the rest of the community resources um, committee. Um, I have just a. I know you want to sort of get into a little bit of the detail of the um, this proposed amendment. So I have a brief um, presentation uh, and then just it, I think the best thing would just be Q and A and you can ask away. <laughs> um, so I think what I'll start with is I'll share my screen um, and pull up a slideshow and start at that, but tell me if you can um, see the slideshow presentation. We can. Okay. Um, so uh, this, um, I want to go back and look at the history a little bit of the zero lot line. It's been on the books for over 20 years um, in different forms. Initially, um, it was adopted to allow for a different variety of layouts within an open space residential cluster development, which is the development scenario in which you have um, at least right now is at least four acres of land in which you want to create individual lots within that, but in a clustered way and permanently protect open space as part of that development. Um, and uh, at that point, it was just one of the options you could, an applicant could utilize to lay out parcels within an open space cluster, um, just to give a little bit more flexibility about how houses were located on their lots. Um, and this is the way uh, many communities around the country use it as well as an in individual um, applica lot applications as well. So a few years after that, it was adopted um, for use in the urban residential B and C districts, which I'll show a map in a little bit just to refresh your memory about where those districts are, but generally around um, surrounding downtown Northampton and then um, out to Florence Center or the URB and URC districts. Um, and when it was adopted, it was um, initially used um, all, frequently to enable the reduction in the frontage requirements for lots, because if you did a zero lot line project and you complied with the requirements of being owner, um, owner owned for all the parcels that were part of this project, and then you were dividing lot lines within and creating a zero side setback, which is what's referred to as, I should have backed up and said, zero lot line means um, one of your lot lines has a zero up to a maximum or up to a zero side setback on one of the lot lines. Um, and so um, I have some examples of patterns of, of its use from the early um, 
years um, and currently the way it's being used, frankly. Um, but it was um, at the time, there was a, a larger frontage requirement for standard lots that were just built as individual A&Rs, um, one-off parcels. And so zero lot line was a way to reduce frontage as well as reduce a side setback because the frontage requirements I think were um, 50 feet, um, initially 65 feet, then they dropped to 50 feet. Um, so it was a, a mechanism to allow more flexibility within the urban core neighborhoods to reduce your frontage and then also your setbacks. Um, as the zoning changed over time, um, the frontage requirements for all lots in the urban residential B and C districts were modified down and, and reduced from 75 feet to 50 feet. So you, the use of zero lot line to reduce frontage was no longer necessary, but it was still a good tool to allow more flexibility in where you locate your structure on a property. Um, so um, um, the examples on this page, there was um, this actually on the upper right side, there's a survey here showing an existing single family home and the property owner had a big lot and created a new dividing line down the center here. Um, and this was done under the zero lot line provision so that this new parcel could have a single family home. And this reduced this this lot division happened at the time when it, um, the zero lot line provision allowed a reduction in frontage. So this person took advantage of the not only the reduced frontage but also the reduced side setback. And then this aerial photo shows the existing condition today after the new house was built. So this is the new lot that was created with the new house on it, and you can see the houses are closer together, but they're not right on the lot line. And the survey shows that too for the existing house. The house isn't exactly at zero, but it's um, maybe three or four feet. And so that provided that flexibility for this property owner. Um, another um, scenario, these are two other scenarios where there's sort of a, um, there were two zero lot lines created in this example on Crosby Street where these, the, all of this block was owned by an individual and uh, the person created two additional lots, but wanted to take advantage of that reduced setback because of the narrowness of uh, the width of the lot allows a slightly bigger house footprint if you don't have a 15 foot side setback um, and you have a little bit of a smaller setback then your footprint your house can be wider than 20 feet wide because one, if you have a 50 foot wide lot and you have two 15 foot side setbacks on either side, um, then after you subtract all of that, your building footprint can only be 20 feet wide. So you have a very, a pretty skinny house unless you take advantage of a smaller side setback um, that zero lot line setbacks enable currently under today's ordinances. Um, this one on the far left is an example of um, the property line going down the middle of the structure. So you have a duplex unit effectively with um, um, each property owner actually owning the land underneath the unit instead of just having um, um, a condominium structure of shared um, ownership of the parcel. And frankly, this was this um, scenario on Emerson Way is what initially going back 20 years ago was the impetus for creating zero lot line to allow um, properties and, and particularly through conversations with Habitat for Humanity um, about their interest in allowing homeowners um, to be able to own their own piece of property even though they were sharing a party wall, which actually made it more cost effective to build a house um, where you've got two units attached to each other, but it afforded um, ownership of land underneath so that each property owner could have that sense of their own space that they cared for and they didn't have to share that with their neighbor. Um, so um, as I mentioned after the um, 
changes in 2012-2013 for frontage, um, the, the use of zero lot line became more about um, creating opportunities for flexibility and side setbacks. Um, so this ordinance in front of you is another sort of step in tweaking or modification of zero lot line as, as um, um, things change. Um, this was specifically put forward because of concerns we heard about design of the zero lot line layouts and the effect that people felt like it um, presented in neighborhoods or this alley concept that if you don't have your full 10 or 15 foot setbacks for each property, for each structure on a property, then it creates a sense of uh, more of an alley that might not be so consistent with um, what setbacks are in the neighborhood. So what's in front of you, and I'll go through the details in a minute, um, are ways that could potentially address that issue. Um, and there may be other ways to do it too, or even modifications to what's in front of you that might be even better, but we wanted to sort of start that conversation. Um, also, there was a um, concern that zero lot line wasn't clearly enough defined and to just be about single family homes. And there was a concern that other structures could be added to properties in this um, using this tool and then um, create multiple structures on a property that are really close to the lot line. So this language in front of you clarifies that. Um, it increases the setbacks um, and sort of, and sets out three um, clearer standards through use of graphics that weren't, aren't currently present in the zoning uh, to um, illustrate what zero lot line means. Um, and I will say that over the years that I've been with the planning office, um, I've always had to explain what zero lot line meant to anybody who was building. And um, so I'm hoping that graphics help, you know, um, describe what has always been um, necessary for me to describe in words <laughs> and that that's much more um, understandable to everyone involved, even the builders um, and, and homeowners. Um, the other piece of this is to change the location of where these standards are, are within the zoning to be within the dimensional um, subsection of the zoning where many of the other um, detailed layout, lot layout standards are located. Um, it, it, since this originated um, in the with in the context of um, special permit for cluster open space development, the standards has lived there for 20 years, but we've always referred to them in the by right standards. And so, as we did in um, flag lot standards and two family standards and a lot of other um, pieces of the zoning we've moved that into section six. So that's what this would accomplish as well. So the three basic um, allowances to clarify within the, um, this proposed amendment are um, showing this graphic on the, starting on the left, you could either do a zero lot line where you own a piece of property and you're creating a dividing line down the middle um, and your property abuts um, permanently protected open space, then you could put your structure right on that lot line because you abut open space. The caveat of this, um, of course, would be that you'd have to be able to show that you have a maintenance easement along this line um, for any need that you might have to access this side of the house once it's built. And um, so certainly public open space uh, owned by the city, um, uh, would not be eligible for granting easements for private use like that. So it might not, um, this certainly wouldn't um, be applicable in uh, for lots that abut um, city owned open space. The second scenario would be um, uh, the duplex scenario, basically, where you just have a property lined right down the middle of a structure. 
Um, and so that that is zero feet. <laughs> Um, or you could also potentially have, I mean, basically any part of the structure that's touching would be considered an attached structure. And so if you draw the property line down that middle or down that, um, that would be an allowed um, layout, which it currently is as well. And then the third option would be if you had a series of lots um, and you wanted to create um, three lots with zero lot line, let's say in this example, or four or five, whatever it is, um, you could do them in um, each structure being on the opposite side lot line in this um, scenario here. But the last parcel in the series would have to sort of be the bookend and, and create the separation between that parcel and another property that's not under the same ownership as the um, applicant's parcel. Um, and I want to go into a little detail of this, and we can do this now or later, but um, I don't know necessarily that two times the minimum setback for a district is the right number. We started out with looking at just a standard setback so that it sort of starts to meet, you know, be the first property that meets all the setbacks, just like every other house in the neighborhood has to meet. Um, but we also were weighing um, issues of um, just uh, trying to create sort of a bigger potential buffer between these lots and the rest of the lots that might be in a neighborhood. Um, so that's definitely something to think about. Um, and I wanna go into sort of this, the issues here with some of the changes that are proposed. Um, the, uh, you know, I guess what we're saying is a benefit of this change is beyond just sort of reorganizing the zoning and creating graphics to represent what we're talking about in text. Um, it um, definitely says, you know, you basically you have to create either, you're either at zero or you're meeting the minimum setbacks and there's nothing in between. Um, and the downside of that, of course, is that when you're reducing flexibility, because if you've reduced that ability to have anything between zero and 15 feet, then you get to the point where with many of these lots that are in the city that are 50 feet wide, you're really confined to a very small house footprint. So this picture on the upper right, it shows what it's like to build on a 50 foot wide lot and have to meet your 15 foot side setbacks. So the profile, obviously this is a much narrower house than uh, the other houses in the, on the block and in the neighborhood. And it can't always accommodate everyone's needs in terms of the space they might need inside the house. So um, definitely, this proposal minimizes the flexibility of um, providing a little bit more wiggle room for a width of a structure. Um, and there are many examples of setbacks in the URB and the URC district that are 10 feet. And in fact, in URC, this is not such a, a big issue because in urban residential C, besides setbacks are 10 feet anyway for every house. Um, so when you have a, a 50 foot wide lot in the um, C district, you already have a little bit more wiggle room to work with your building footprint. Um, so um, one consideration to sort of think about would be eliminating that two times the minimum setback for the last structure on a bookend um, because it's a little bit, well, it's twice the width of many of the standard setbacks in a district. Um, or allow zero um, anywhere between um, either zero um, setback or maybe do a dimension between the next abutting structure so that you have at least 15 feet. So you're not creating an alley, but you're not exactly meeting a 15 foot setback. So in effect, that's seven and a half feet of setback for each structure instead of um, a full 15 feet. Um, Another alternative to think about, which couldn't be done through this zoning ordinance, would be just to go ahead and look at the urban residential A, B, and C districts in total and think about reducing 
the setbacks for all structures in those districts um, to match what many of the setbacks are already, maybe down to 12 feet instead of 15 feet or even down to 10 feet to match urban residential C. But just something to think about and, and talk about as, as um, a way to uh, allow for more flexibility when you have smaller width lots. Um, the picture on the lower left is an example, another example of a zero lot line that took advantage of the flexible setback. So I can't remember exactly what the setback was for this new gray house to this yellow house, but the property owner in the yellow house created this lot line. And I think there's about five feet on each side of the property line in this um, picture. So there have been several examples of um, way of properties that have um, utilized this mechanism to create more flexibility in that setback for these narrower lots. Um, and that's, that's all I had on this one. So I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I, I, so Carolyn, I, I just want to do a, uh, just ask you, you, you mentioned that there might be a number of proposals or additions to this that we might want to consider. Um, as part of this package? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are other ways to look at eliminating the concern about creating an alley effect um, without completely eliminating um, the allowance for having um, structures under a zero lot line um, be less than the minimum side setback. So, um, for example, uh, you know, the way the ordinance is structured now, it's either you have two touching structures or your structures are on opposite side lot lines and there's nothing in between. Whereas right now, um, Many people have used the zero lot line just to reduce the setback, but not have abutting structures. So sometimes when they've reduced the setbacks, the gap has been very narrow. And I think that's what people are responding to, that design sort of concern uh, with having houses maybe five feet from each other or six feet apart instead of maybe um, 15 feet apart. You're still with two structures that are 15 feet apart, you're still, that would mean approximately seven and a half feet of setback instead of the standard 15 feet. Um, so you get a little bit more space between structures, but you're not at the standard 15 foot setback. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there to consider that this, the way the ordinance is presented to you certainly has its um, negative side, but, and I think it's a good point of conversation, but I think we wanted to present sort of the, I guess I would say the one extreme of modifying zero lot line and show that there are other ways to address that design concern. Okay. and. Um... One more quick question. Can you explain the alley effect, what precisely that is? I don't know. It's a, I mean, it's a term. So um, it just means that um, it could be alley or canyon or the, the idea that you have houses really close together and you just have a small, um, you know, pathway between two structures, which in um, some of the urban <laughs> residential B districts, in some neighborhoods, there are houses that are much farther apart, um, but there's a whole eclectic mix, right, of, of setbacks. And I think in for Ward 3, a lot of Ward 3 is urban residential C, where the setbacks have tend to be a little bit smaller, so anywhere from 5 to 10 feet apart. So it might not present to people in some of those neighborhoods as an alley. But in other neighborhoods, it might, you know, having structures that close together might feel like it's a little bit like you're in a city and you're or looking through a canyon. Oh, oh 
of walls and that it doesn't feel quite feel so comfortable. Um, but at, whatever the term is, it, it's really meant to describe the proximity of two structures together and whether, you know, what is that dimension that feels right? Thank you. So um, what I'd like to do is open discussion, you know, questions first to counselors. Um, and I'm realizing Councillor Jarrett, you are right. We should have a motion on the floor. Uh, so if somebody could make a, a motion for a recommendation to council, um, I would entertain that. Three, two, one. <laughs> Who's recommendation to count? I had to unmute myself. Unmute myself. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, did somebody say they'd make a motion? I just made the motion. Okay, so Councilor Thorpe made a motion uh, to. No uh, second. Okay, and is it for a positive recommendation, Councilor Thorpe? As of right now, I'm going to say yes, but I'd like to hear more as we as we move yeah, forward. Yeah, and we can change that as we go. Thank oh. you. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, so we have the motion on the floor. Counselors, I, any questions for uh, uh, Carolyn Mish? Uh, Counselor Jared. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, so zero lot land developments in URB and URC are, are by right. Um, and uh, that um, can you explain why they don't require a site plan review? Um, for example, if we're looking at, say, the townhome style zero lot line, like on Emerson Way, that creates a two family in appearance, um, but it doesn't have the new fossil fuel requirements that we now have or trigger the significant tree ordinance or other site plan considerations. Um, which, so if, if you could speak to, you know, why? Why are we? Why do we not uh, require site plan review or those other considerations in zero lot line? Well, um, first of all, I'll say that in Emerson Way, those there were six lots that were created as duplex lots way back in two thousand and three. So um, the over time they've adjusted instead of creating a, a a lot, one lot with two structures on it, um, they came back to amend to create um, two structures, but on two separate lots. And that was part of their amendment to their cluster open space um, project. Um, so that had been approved as a two family years ago. Um, and this has always been, viewed as a single family home. So this is, was only applicable in this situation of a single family residence. So you could do a single family zero lot line. That's how it was defined. Um, so it, and it, single families have always been and will um, is by right for various reasons um, in, in the state. Um, uh, single family homes are by right. So um, although from the street, it looks like a duplex, we're still calling it a single family because it's one unit on a parcel, even though the buildings may be touching. Um, so <clears throat> you're saying that even though the buildings are touching, these are still single families and meet the, are in the state's category where they uh, are by right, and we're not allowed to um, uh, uh, require things, even though, I mean, like a ZLL is a zoning bonus of some kind, it seems. Um, and we, we do require more trees to be planted in the case of using zero lot line, but we wouldn't be allowed to uh, require fossil fuel free heating like we do with two families. Is that your opinion? Uh, well, there's only, um, so short answer, yes, except that certainly you could apply for, uh, to a situation in which you're creating the attached structure. So the problem is this is a single, it's a single structure on a single unit. It just, I mean, on, on a single lot, I'm sorry. 
so essentially it's a, it's considered a single um, single family house lot because each structure each structure is on its own lot um, and uh, you um, there are also different ways that the zero lot line can be used obviously the second the other way is to have them offset you know on each one sort of sequentially on its opposite side lot line um and so that obviously doesn't that's probably easier to visualize in terms of having being a single family on its own lot um but yes we're still treating this as their single family homes and not duplexes and so um, we can regulate the outside, like the, we can add trees, re tree requirements, for example, because that doesn't violate the single family uh, state, the state's single family rule, but we couldn't uh, regulate the inside of a single family dwelling. Right. And so, sorry, I didn't answer that question about the trees and how that, I mean, those provisions for requiring trees have been in there since, I don't know, 15 years ago, or whatever, I think the idea was, and this was actually goes back to the time before um, the frontage change for all lots. So in that sense, we are creating standards as you, you know, you mentioned it's sort of like a density bonus because we are creating um, the allowance for creating lots that had sm slightly less frontage and less setback. So we wanted to incorporate um, other elements that um, that um, would enable a new structure to fit into a neighborhood more, to make it feel like it fits there because you've got new plantings and you it might match some of the other um, how some of the older homes in a neighborhood might have sort of grown up with vegetation and trees. So. There are elements that we included, and, and I will also say there are many, um, site plan is a creature of a local um, community and can be regulated. Um, or you can add things any way you want it. It doesn't have to be planning board review. It can be administrative review because it really is administrative um, oversight and technical oversight. Um, and so, uh, the policy um, and sort of um, goals of what the ordinance is trying to do is say, okay, if we know there are certain elements that we want as a community for projects to have or for um, lots to uh, accommodate and they're, they're non-discretionary, let's just put them in the zoning and it's just almost like a checkbox and there's no need to send it for, you know, more discretionary review through a planning board review process if um, they're very easily accommodated and uh, regulated by administrative staff. Um, so yes, we've included those things that sometimes are part of site plan, but they're very simple yes or no kind of um, reviews. It doesn't require a staff person to to um, use judgment as to whether or not someone's meeting a certain standard. And so that kind of thing we wanna keep by right and not have it just pulled out for planning board just for the sake of having a public hearing process. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if, if um, you answered all, almost all of my questions, but there was one um, just to, to be clear that we, we can't, we could not allow fossil fuel free heating as a density bonus for zero lot line because it's still a single unit on a yeah. single lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Councillor Foster. I could read your lips, Councillor Nash. I was, I was, I was gonna <laughs> take my turn. <laughs> Carolyn, thanks for being here. I was um, struck and I wanted to clarify something um, from what you were presenting to make sure I'm understanding correctly. One of the considerations 
or I'll tell you what I understood and then tell me if that mm -hmm. is, is what you intended. One of the considerations for zero lot line zoning would be to free up space on the lot and allow for larger homes to be built on the lot. Am, am I understanding that correctly? That that allows then rather than the 20 foot house on a 50 foot lot, it can allow for a larger home to be built on the same lot. Um, yeah, it can, uh, yes, I guess ultimately it would be larger. I was just gonna say um, wider may not ultimately result in a larger square footage, but just an easier footprint within which to work. You know, if you think about 20, feet of width, um, you know, and trying to put two rooms together with a hallway in between um, on the inside, um, that's um, hard to accommodate. You have to be kind of creative to accommodate that. So I guess, yes, in one respect, it would be bigger, but I don't know, comparatively, it doesn't necessarily mean it would be in total square footage bigger. It might okay. just be that it's designed in a in a different way you know it's instead of long and skinny it can be a little bit broader yeah i guess what i'm what i'm struggling with is or making sure i'm understanding the implications because one of the one of the concerns we're hearing is about you know the cost of housing in northampton and then incentives for development of larger houses um and so I guess what I'm trying to understand or make sure that I'm understanding clearly is, um, you know, it, if we move towards zero lot line development, are we then kind of incentivizing or making it easier for the development of larger houses, which, you know, it's, I just want to make sure that that's, that that's understood. Whereas if, if we don't do that, are we incentivizing then smaller houses um, which may tend toward the more financially accessible or um, more um, energy efficient? Well, just, I mean, we have zero lot line now. Um, I think that it's, uh, I don't know the numbers. It's not my um, area of expertise, but what I've heard from builders um, is that it's actually harder in some situations it's harder to build in a skinnier footprint because then you're actually building something custom and you have to size it um, in a way that fits that narrower profile which in the end because you have to be a little bit more specialized in how you fit something in that smaller dimension um, that might add to the cost as opposed to just being able to pull something off the shelf that's pre-designed, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to hire an architect and an engineer to figure out how you're going to shrink down what you want in two rooms and a hallway down to what will fit on that lot. So I don't, I can't say that these changes will result in smaller houses that will be more affordable. Um, these changes, uh, the goal of these changes were really to address, to one, make it easier for people to understand what the heck is zero lot line? What do we mean by that? And also address a design concern about, um, about the close proximity that um, some houses are to each other by um, some people who have used um, this to, um, reduce their setbacks. Now, the one example I showed you, it all depends on the lot size. The one example I showed you where um, early on before the frontage changed and those were two massive single family homes. One was an existing massive single family home and then the zero lot line house was also big, but that lot was quite big and it was in an area, it, the property owner wanted to build that size house. Um, the uh, it, we certainly aren't trying to um it's not the intent of this ordinance to to um try to dictate the size of someone's house that they might build um that's not the goal i 
Thank you, Carolyn. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Foster, or did that do it? My wheels are turning. I don't have a follow-up. I know, mine moment. are too. We're all in. Yeah. The hamster's running. <laughs> Councillor Thorpe. My, my, my wheels are turning, and I'm not sure if Carolyn can maybe briefly summarize or, or tell me simply what are some of the drawbacks to this? Yeah, so um, I think the primary drawback is going to be the loss of um, that flexibility to um, you, the way um, that zero lot line has been used. Um, I would say primarily it's been used to reduce setbacks, but not reduce it all the way to zero. So I think the biggest um, downside of what's on the table in front of you is um, re reduction of that flexibility of being able to locate structures, particularly in the context of um, a 50 foot to 55 foot wide parcel. Councillor Jarrett, right, Councillor Thorpe, were you through? No, I'm still, still, I'm still thinking, Councillor Jarrett. Okay, well, we, I, we can come back to you as well, <laughs> Councillor Jarrett. Yeah, and if, Councillor Nash, if you have questions, I don't mean to jump. No, I. <laughs> okay. I have questions. I'm letting everybody go first. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, Carolyn, uh, just some thoughts in my mind as you were giving a presentation on URB and URC and how they already have different setbacks. And that's you know because they have different uh, characters of, in general of their the neighborhood and um, so I'm curious what you would think of of a idea like where the zero lot line setback could be either zero feet the townhome style or um, five feet less than the standard setback. So in URB you could have uh, you, it could be reduced to a ten foot width or likely 20 feet total. Um, and uh, in URC, it could be reduced to a five feet width, you know, 10 feet total um, or something of that, you know, those no, that number doesn't necessarily mean exact, but, but to basically kind of key it to the existing um, zoning requirement for setbacks, but to allow some reduction, but not to the point where it would go significantly beyond what is typical for that neighborhood or that those zoning districts. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great um, uh, approach um, to have it sort of um, structured to the district. Um, and um, I think that would provide that flexibility, um, you know, keep, I guess, keep that flexibility, but also a, um, make sure that it doesn't get so close to another structure that it looks out of place in in that zoning district. There's lots of hamsters working here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, I'll hop in with some questions here. So, Carolyn, this applies. This is applying to both URC, URB. U R A. You said right. both. That's two, Just but you got them right the first time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and um, and that we recently expanded the two family, but that's doesn't does it have any impact on that? That yeah. okay. Only that it clarifies that this is only applicable to one. Um, principal structure on the property. So you couldn't have a detached um, other residential structure on the same property if you were taking advantage of the zero lot line. Okay, so. That, that certainly was a concern that was raised in the public hearing process for um, the two family in the URB district. That if someone were doing a zero lot line, they could also add another structure and have that zero lot line too. 
Okay. When I hear zero lot line so many times, <laughs> I start to forget what I'm hearing. So <laughs> let's say uh, there's a property, it's got a principal structure, and then somebody wants to add on, you know, another uh, uh, single family structure. They're, they can do that in URB and URC, but could they use the zero lot line to divide that property? And then thus, I mean, because right now that that you'd have two single families and they'd be part of the same property or yeah, the same land. Um, could the, the land property be divided in such a way that now those two structures could be sold with on, you know, as zero lot line type properties? Um, only if you had the minimum frontage required for each newly proposed lot. So you yeah. still need to meet that. You still need to meet the open space requirement. So in both URB and URC, that's 50 feet, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Um, any other uh, questions coming up here? All right, I see, I see um, we're all still thinking and it might be a good time to bring in some of our many patient members of the public here. Uh, Jackie Balance's hand keeps going up and down. I, I, I know no, she's got something no. to share. <laughs> I just got a quick math question. So, uh, Jackie, um, I'm gonna recognize you. And I also wanna mention that you sent to me earlier today, um, uh, just like an hour ago, about five do five documents that you wanted to share as part of your question. Not you, now. You don't wanna do that now? Later, maybe. Okay, so if there's more time later, you wanna go back to that. Yeah, th this is just a quick math question. If you got 50 foot frontage. Go ahead. And a house on a zero lot line, absolute zero, because it has an easement, say. And then on the opposite side of the house, you have a 15 foot setback. 50 minus 15 means you could have a 35 foot wide facade. And that's five feet wider than the current limits. Is it not? I'm talking about the, the facade of the house on a 50 foot lot line on a 50 foot frontage with a zero lot line. You could get a 35 foot wide house, right? And that's bigger than what's that allowed now. I assume that's for me. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to figure it out. It's a good question though. 50 Jack. feet minus 15. Yeah. No, I, I think everybody's math is clear. I think it depends on your layout. So if you want the the I the concern is if you have two lot if you have it in the scenario of um, scenario two that I showed on the screen where you've got um, the lot line between the zero lot line is the shared line between two structures. If you um, don't um, want to have abutting structures, if you don't want to create the property line to divide the structure itself and you want to have some separation, um, the way that, you, that the ordinance currently exists is that you can do that. You can have anywhere between zero and 14 feet of setback to allow for that flexibility. Um, but the proposed language says you either have touching structures or you're on opposite um, side lot lines and that, then you've got, you know, more than two that have to be part of your project as opposed to just starting with, let's say, one lot and you wanted to just create a dividing line down the middle. That's so that's where the flexibility goes away with this proposal. It's but, not about if you have, um, if your structures are touching. That doesn't answer my question. All right, well, try asking it again, Jackie. Okay, you have 50 feet of frontage on one of the, and the house is on a zero lot line. The other side has to be 15 feet. How much is left? for the house. 
Right. Again, your math is correct, but 35. that's only in the scenario where you have touching structures. You might want to have a scenario in which the structures I, aren't abutting. I don't see where the uh, touching structures um, pertain. Looking at the example that has the four houses in a row. Right. That's not the one that, that's of concern. That's the it's one that the, I'm asking about. Right. That one, you're absolutely right. You could have a wider structure in that scenario. Thank you. But not in the other scenarios. So you could have a wider house, not a narrower house. I like that 20 foot house. I'll shut up. So I, I'm going to take that to mean that. <laughs> um, so. Um, well, I see Councillor Jarrett, but I, I'd like to go. We opened up the floor to the public, and I see Bill Ryan has his hand raised. And um, Laura, could you unmute Mr. Ryan? Can, can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Welcome. Yeah, just. Just, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for allowing us to participate. And Carolyn, thank you very much for advancing this proposal. It, it uh, stimulates lots of thought, obviously. Um, just to follow up Jackie's question, I think the point that she's making is, let's say you have the two houses back to back on the, with the zero lot line right, right between them, right down the party wall. I think what Jackie's saying is that house, those two together could become 70 feet wide, basically because you have zero on one side, you have 15 feet on the other side, so that leaves 35 feet in the middle for the two houses to be joined. And um, depending upon the depth of the lot, it could go as wide as 35 feet. So I think that's what our concern is, is that this proposal will allow for very wide houses. Or as another example on the, the second part, where you had the, the three side by side, you could have three 35 foot wide houses with only 15 feet in between each of them uh, if the lot is deep enough. So I think that's the concern she's raising, which links back to uh, Councillor Foster's question about does this allow larger homes to be built than would be built under the standard, which would be 25 foot wide, 20 foot wide houses, and then as deep as the lot would allow. Um, and so I think that's the concern that Jackie's raising. And I think it's a valid one because it will, as we've seen in developments in Bay State, uh, lead to much wider houses uh, than uh, would normally be allowed. So does that make sense? I think I'm trying to clarify a bit of what Jackie was asking about. No, I understood what she was asking about. Um, I don't, I would say currently you can do that. I, I wouldn't say that the houses in Bay State are wider than what, um, is normal. I think they're, they're, you know, an 1800 square foot house that's two stories. Um, that's about a, a 30 foot wide house as opposed or 28 feet, maybe even as opposed to a 20 foot wide. 20 feet is very narrow. Most houses in Northampton aren't that narrow. Um, but so the, currently, the setback was a lot. That's what the original layout of a 50 foot wide, 75 foot deep was assuming a 20 by four, 40, a 45 foot house. So the same same uh, 900 square feet as a 30 by 30. But with the zero lot line, you end up with much wider houses as a result and much less space between houses, which then changes the kind of rhythm of the, of the street face as you're walking down because you have these big houses that are stuck close together and then much wider spaces. So, so it, it, it does allow for larger than was originally envisioned by the 50 foot by 75, which was kind of the standard. So it, it creates a much different environment depending upon whether the houses in the neighborhood are square houses, essentially, which a 30 by 30 is, or more narrow houses. And most of the houses in, in at least my area of Bay State are more at the 20 by 40 originally, and then they people have added stuff on. So just this sets, the main point is it just sets up a different feeling in the neighborhood when uh, these big square houses come in, um, it, it, it uh, changes the streetscape and it also allows for more expensive homes to be built as we're seeing. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I understand the the concern. There's nothing in this proposal that adds to what's already allowed. And I wouldn't say that the 20 foot wide house is common in Northampton at all. Um, so, and I think the standard there, there's no standard width probably either in any of these neighborhoods because most neighborhoods are sort of built out at different decades and have different styles. But um, the, certainly the, um, the issue is more, um, and in fact, many of the 50 foot wide lots that were historically built on have much less setback than a 15 foot side setback. Um, and that varies too. Um, but, you know, there are examples in a lot of different neighborhoods with those uh, 50 foot wide lots the houses really that are more square as opposed to slender net rectangles um, do have less than a 15 foot side step. But just one last point, then I'll be quiet. But it depends upon the street face. It depends upon the block face. And that's what we're concerned about is, well, in that particular area where those houses are being built, how does it fit in with the current place? Because you're right, from one, and base stated this way, from one block to another, you can have much different um, arrangements of the types of houses. So that's why the doesn't fit standard very intelligently says in the design standard, very intelligently that it's the block face you're that you're looking at as opposed to what's going on two blocks away. So, so it's just, you know, does it fit into the area where, um, where it is? That, that's the big concern. And, and the question, and I, I think there are ways of figuring out how to, to deal with this because the the zero lot line has some advantages, as you point out, and, uh, and has some disadvantages depending upon the specific situation you find yourself in, which is why Councilor Jarrett's suggesting that we move to a, a site plan review or approval. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you, Bill. And did you have any other questions for Carolyn in, in that, Bill, or? No, I didn't, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And if you have another question, we'll come back to you. I want to go to Councillor Jarrett and then to back to uh, Jackie Balance. I think Councillor Jarrett had a question that'll probably help frame things better here. Councillor Jarrett. Yeah, um, I just wanted to go uh, back to what something that Bill mentioned about how you could have three 30 foot wide houses with three 50 foot lots um, and under this under scenario two only uh, two of them could be 35 feet wide um, the because because the last in the series has the two times minimum setback um, actually that that last one couldn't even be 50 feet it would have to be much bigger um, in order to then uh, fit even a 20 foot wide house. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm being clear, but, but essentially you have to have the series in order to have the wider house is, is my point under this new proposal. Uh, and in the, um, or you have to use the, the zero lot line uh, where it's truly zero shared party wall in order to have a uh, right. wider house, which you can already do. Um, but which, as I expressed, there I do have some concern about how we're allowing what appears to be a single family, I mean a two family, but without those um, re those um, review and 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 restriction that uh, we for a true two family. But I'm not sure how to address that. If I could just quickly respond, you're right, Councilor Jared. Yeah, I wasn't talking, I was, but the, the, the proposal is for a series. So it could be a series of three, it could be a series of five, it could be a series. So I was just referring to three possible, not, not the actual example that's, uh, that's given. So I, I agree with you. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Jackie, um, you're up again. Yeah, the, the problem as I see it is a matter of proportion. When you have a smaller lot, 50 foot frontage, it begs for a smaller house. A big house wants a bigger lot. A small lot wants something in proportion, in harmony. Um, and I hope, I just hope that we're discussing 
21.218 now because 21.217 is another issue that I have other comments for. Thank you. Well, we're discussing them both at once because one is just moving some things. Well, oh, that's a biggie. That's a biggie. Yeah, we'll go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, this that's where I wanted to show my pictures. Okay, um, <laughs> sure. So uh, can we, we run through them? Sure. Can Laura? We... Okay, um, there's five. Do you want to start from the left? With the yeah, start one? from the left. And th th this will be this will be quick because We've all seen some of them before. Okay, when Laura gets number one up, I'll start on the left. Hope this Usually when we're doing this in one. person, people are allowed to hand out um, copies of things they wanna share. And this is the Zoom equivalent of that. So uh, thank you. Becky's just handed us all a piece of paper while we're sitting in council chambers. <laughs> How can I get this thing? All right. Here's the zero lot line that we already saw. You see that there's three, the first three lots are all owned by the same person. That's what makes it a develop development. Next screen, please. Sure, okay. I can't make my thing. Here we go. Is, it, is this right? Uh, this is a, the picture, this is text. That's, that's right, that's the text of the zero lot line developments as it stands now in section 1014. And if the same wording uh, is in the revision as the law as it stands right now, where it says the zero lot line side of a house must abut the line of a lot which is under the control of the same property owner at the same time that the zero lot line development is proposed. This is called a development. And that's the key difference here. You see, it comes right under adult establishments and other undesirable things that require special permit. We're talking up, we're not talking about a single family house by right building on a zero lot line. We're talking about a development with a capital D. Next picture, please. You'll see, whoops, that's not it. There it is. Can you zoom in a little bit? You can see that this is three parcels owned by the same person. Um, John Hansel at 61 Warner Street. And the note says, can this house be five feet off the line? Five feet off the line is a nominal zero lot line. That lot on the west is extra wide to accommodate the bookend that has been described because of a very steep slope on the west side. But this is, um, okay, just a remarkably uncanny resemblance to the um, illustration in the new revised ZLL developments. Next picture, please. That's okay. If you could zoom in, this is the house on lot three. It's a zero lot line. It has the nominal five feet on the west side. <sighs> Next, and it has 15 feet on the east side, so that might be, that's a 30 foot house. Here's another one. The abutting house in the middle, lot two, is five feet from the line. The same owner on both sides. It's being built as a single family home, but it's part of the greater development as development as defined in section 10.14. Last picture, please. This is, if you could enlarge that, please. This is what it's going to look like when these three houses are built at 61 Warner Street. The three on the west end are going to, this is drawn to scale. The three houses on the west end are going to dwarf every other house on the block and we're going to have to live with it. And the same thing is existing on the east end of the block on the other side of the street with two houses that's what it looks like. And it's clear that this is a development. It's not a single family home being done by right, built by right. I, I would like to ask the city solicitor to look at 350-10.14 and determine whether or not a zero lot line development 
requires special permitting. It's the way it's written right now. It's the way I see it. I think it's important to examine what's being done in terms of where the ordinance sits right now in the code. It requires special permit. And I don't want to move it from that location till we know the full implications. So I, I'm, I, I don't care what you, what you do about the revisions. I just don't want you to move it out of 350-10. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Carolyn, you want to respond to that or? Sure. I mean, the, um, uh, as I said at the beginning, the ordinance, the, so this started out as being a provision that cre was created as a subsection, um, an option within cluster, cluster itself, a special permit, but the use of zero lot line was, was allowed uh, um, either in cluster or now in the table of use under URB and URC in the table of use, it specifically says zero lot line allowed by right. Um, but it says, you know, refer to 1014 for other, all the other layout and um, planting requirements that are um, required as part of any zero lot line. So instead of, um, at the time when it was added to B and C, it was um, in, instead of, um, creating a separate section for zero lot line, everything that we wanted in there to be applicable to the B and C for individual lots that people wanted to create. Um, we, um, we knew it was already there. So just when you create it by right, you say, okay, see this section and you can see what additional requirements are. Um, but it doesn't um, mean that it's special permit. It just means that's where those provisions lived and um, Alan Seawald knows about this. Um, I talked to him about Jackie's concern and um, you know, he said he, he thinks it makes sense because it's all about dimensions and standards that it go into the section six um, as we've proposed, but it's um, clear in the B and C districts that um, zero lot lines allowed by right. And it, um, the term development can be used for any size, any individual project, any big project. Um, it's not defined as two lots or five lots or, you know, a 10,000 square foot building. Um, so, um, these are really individual and because they're allowed but through a and r approval not required you go to the planning board you subdivide your lot um that's um a, a creation of a lot that's that's by right but it's it is defined as two or more in the zero lot line developments section because it has two lots owned by the same person it's not a se section, uh, attachment seven says a single family home is a, gets a zero lot line by right. This is not a single family home. This is a two or more lots together in section. Right, that's because the property owner has to be in control of the area, the geographic space. Um, and then when, once you create that line, now you've got two lots it's, that are fall under the zero lot line. And it's under special permits, leave it there. You've been clear. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I see uh, Bill Ryan has his hand. Uh, I'm going to jump to Councillor Jarrett and then to Bill Ryan. Yeah, this is just directly related to what Jackie was talking about. Carolyn, so mm -hmm. when we do an update like this, as to, you know, as if we pass something, it doesn't apply to projects already in, in progress. Is that correct? So, you know, for example, in on on Warner Street, that 5761, whatever the other one will be, that that will that's already been laid out under the existing one. Is is that correct, or will this change impact that? Um, so ordinances take effect. Um, if an ordinance is adopted, then um, 
the way the statute's written is it goes back, um, the ordinance is viewed as though it's been in effect from the date of the public hearing notice that's published. So um, if someone already pulled a building permit before the public hearing notice um, or obtained a, any other kind of permit from, if, for example, if a site plan was required I'm sorry, or a special permit was required for a project, any zoning change um, that might modify what might have been allowed under a special permit um, is only um, effective for projects that start after that public hearing notice. So if John Hanstel in this particular situation already has a building permit, then this ordinance wouldn't affect that. Thank you. And uh, so now let's go to Bill Ryan. So this this issue of, of is it a development or is it a single family uh, uh, house is, it's a really difficult conundrum that's been created. Uh, so I'm just gonna throw it out because when, when when people who are concerned about this development, we'll call it that because there's three big units being built. Uh, to go talk to anybody about it, we have to go, the only place we can go is to the building commissioner who is, uh, who is in charge of each of the individual houses as they're permitted and brought on the market. So there's no place in the system other than within building department and planning department talking to each other, I'm sure, where there's any consideration of this as a three unit development. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really difficult. <laughs> and all the protections that are give, being given to single family homes traditionally are now basically being extended to this three family home, <laughs> three, <laughs> three single family uh, de, uh, home development in side by side because, and this is an interesting thing because obviously the zero lot line is being evaluated continuously at, which is why I think this is a great conversation um, and thankful to Carolyn for offering it uh, and the planning department for offering it because we're now looking at this where a developer who is interested in developing many parcels in our neighborhood is now using zero lot line in this way. Whereas all the other examples that I've, I've seen Carolyn off tonight or in other things I've reviewed where she's made presentations way back when, um, it was always, a, a parcel owner and they wanted to divide the parcel and to put another house on it themselves or something. So this is just a whole different use of zero lot line at this point. And I think it needs to be reviewed in that context and a solution brought forth that actually addresses this. Um, that's why to me, I, I, I don't, to me, it's like zero lot line is a exception to the standard zoning which normally if you really wanted an exception to the standard zone, you'd have to go get a special permit if I understand things correctly, which I'm sure I don't fully understand. Where in this case, because the zero lot line is allowed, someone gets a bonus, uh, as Councilor Jarrett said, and uh, the right to build a wider home because that fits their business model, uh, which is what's happening with John Hansel. Uh, he has a 30 by 30 foot business model and he standardizes that and builds it in some form everywhere he goes, whether it's a single family lot or three in a row like this. So, so it's, it's complicated. And um, I hope that we can continue to have a conversation <laughs> about how to actually solve this problem. Because uh, I, I think that what, what has been offered by the planning department is, uh, is creative. I see a lot of potential to it, but I think there's a lot of uh, details that can be worked out, including this, uh, is this, is this really a single family that's protected by, by the uh, uh, normal considerations given to a single family home when, when it's really an exception to the standard setbacks, which would normally go and uh, be required to get a special permit if you wanted a, a real exception is my understanding, but Carolyn knows a lot more about this than I do. Thank you, Bill. Carolyn, you wanna, do you have any response or? Um, you don't have to say anything if you don't want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, single family house lots are single family house lots. And 
Um, there have been times in, in other parts of the city in other years where people have created a whole series of lots um, at once and they were all single family house lots. They weren't necessarily all built on at the same time. Sometimes they are, but they're, um, I mean, it doesn't really matter whether or not someone um, feels that one person doing four lots feels like a development. Um, if they're meeting the lot requirements and they don't have to create a subdivision, meaning they don't have to create frontage um, on a street to in order to create the lots, then um, it goes through the approval not required process um, for, and then when someone builds a single family house that it doesn't really matter how many are in a row if they're all along, you know, a street that that's um, the, the standard, uh, basically, if they're meeting frontage, you can come and get a lot division created doesn't matter how many in a row you're, you're creating. But this is the first time that the zero lot line has been used this extensively for this type of series of lots side by side, which presents no. a different. No, no. You, you have, there are other examples. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are only two. Each of those examples that John Hansel is doing, they're just two next to each other. That's happens. That's happened on more than one occasion. Well, there are three at Warner Street and- um, But they're not uh, all zero lot line. No, but they've been squeezed into the available and we're, we're seeing other properties that are looking the same way, that are gonna go the same way. It's a, it's a series of things he's doing. And, and the zoning is, was particularly, I mean, the, the the zoning is set up to to allow for minimum frontage to to set minimum frontage and lot size requirements for the purposes of allowing new residential units in the city. So whether one person does it one at a time or one person does it two at a time, the end result is the same as long as you're meeting the minimum standards for the zoning. Um, you know, that's, the, that's what the regulations were set up to allow. All right, I'm gonna now go to Reyes Lazaro. Thank you, I'll be brief. Um, it's very hard to follow regulations where language seems to have lost meaning. I'm having George Orwell moments. I don't know what language means any longer. Somebody can build 20 houses and as long as it follows some kind of regulations for single families, this is not considered a development or, um, you know, some, to me, something is wrong with this picture. I live across from one of these constructions on Warner Street, and I'm seeing something that is not, not adequate. And this is part of a larger movement in the economy of the US and the world, where these kinds of houses are being built so that people who are victims of the economy in their own cities have to move to the countryside and people in the countryside cannot afford the houses. This is happening. And in this context, we are allowing language to lose it meaning, its meaning to enable things like this. And we are told that these are family houses. So, something is wrong. Sorry, I cannot put it better. I appreciated a lot Karen Foster's comment or question about whether this is supporting or discouraging smaller houses that are more sustainable and more affordable. And I became more worried when I when I heard, um, um, sorry, Jared, sorry, I've forgotten my councilman. Uh, yes, sorry, Alex Jared. When he said that he made me see that 
they don't even have to follow any standards of sustainability, etc. Something is wrong I mean this kind of regulation that enables things that should not be enabled. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry, that was my daughter calling me. It was not a oh. buzzer to stop you. Thanks for <laughs> listening. It's just that something something doesn't look right in a regulation that enables things where anything can be called anything. I apologize for the interruption there, Reyes. No, thank you for listening. Um, I I don't think there's a, I think maybe there's a um, disconnect in, or maybe I'm just not understanding. And I'll just say this, I don't think it's, it, it necessarily relates to this proposed ordinance, but um, I mean, I use the term development loosely to mean anything that's being built, but it sounds like people in this neighborhood are thinking that development means that if you use that word, it means it has to be a special permit or has to be site plan. Um, so I don't know if it makes sense to use the different terminology Single, these are single family homes on individual lots. And even those I even refer to as a development. It's a development of a house, it's the creation of a house. Um, but it doesn't trigger um, any additional public hearing review. So I, I don't know if that's helpful. I, I wasn't trying to state that the word development doesn't mean development. Um, I think maybe people just have a different view of the weight of that word or something. So thank I, you, you know. Caroline. I think the word development should mean development. And it should mean something that very clearly is happening in Bay State. It should mean something. Words should mean something. And uh, which I guess what I'm saying is that, that I support what what my neighbor Jackie Balance said that this should this belongs in a different part of the ordinance uh, that goes by special permit or something like this. It shouldn't be equated. Sorry, I won't say okay. anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Reyes. Uh, Councilor Jared. Thank you. Thank thanks to everyone who's. Uh, contributed here. It does feel very confusing. Um, and I wanted to sort of lay out some some thoughts I have. So the zero lot line, it, it'll as we stated, it does allow for wider, um, possibly larger single family house sizes on on a given lot. Um, without that zero lot line, the larger houses could only be built with larger lot sizes, which would either result in fewer houses being built um, or more smaller houses. Now, I'm not sure which one would actually happen in, in today's economy. It might just be fewer or rather than smaller. I, I'm not sure, but that would, that would be the, the, the difference. Or um, if a, a, such a development, um, and I'm not sure how to use that, but let's think about where we're building three, those three single family houses. Um, it would the it would have to be structured as a condo association, um, in which case they can be quite close together, um, I, perhaps closer closer than definitely closer than uh, they would be permitted under zero lot line. Um, but they would have to go through a, a site plan review or a special permit process, depending on the size and the number of units. So that's kind of you know the the, the range of of possibilities. Um, as I see it, and I won't just want us to think about where, right, where is that threshold and what, what will that push, uh, push development toward? Will it be toward fewer units, larger? Will it be toward smaller units, more? Or will it be toward condo associations where um, we can have quite a large number, um, but more review? So that, that's what's running through my mind uh, as we think about this. 
Councillor Jarrett, thank you for framing that. That was very eloquent. That really, I, I, I could see all the different uh, pieces of the puzzle just kind of sitting there and that, that, that is the, the trade-offs that we're looking at here. And, um, and Carolyn, does that kind of match the way you're seeing things and that, um, that there's these, there's times where, you know, a, a developer or a property owner will have that choice between, do I go condo or am I going single family homes here? Um, that, do you, do you see that kind of discussion playing out with uh, folks developing here in Northampton? Um, I don't know if I, uh, I'm not sure if zero lot line, um, either in its current form or proposed necessarily is going to dictate building big versus small, um, because it all really depends on what size lot you're starting with. So 50 feet wide is the narrowest that you could create. So in those, in a 50 to a 50 foot wide lot, the flexibility for um, having a reduced setback definitely um, allows something wider than 20 feet. Um, most houses are between 22 and 28 feet wide. And then of course you have the outliers that are on either end of that. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say most houses, I say many houses. Um, um, I think that, but I think it is true, if someone couldn't divide, save the corner that everyone in in this meeting really doesn't like um, on the corner of Warner and um, Hinckley, if um, Mr. Hansel couldn't get three lots in there, potentially he could do two lots and on one lot do two structures and have a condominium association or potentially do three structures on a single lot under a condo association. So absolutely that's an option. I think that um, what we've seen is that the market um, drivers are directed more towards individual homes on their own lots. So it could be that maybe you get, if you didn't, couldn't quite fit the structure you want to build on a property, then you might go down, instead of doing three lots, you might do two. And then you might have two lots that have bigger structures on it because the whole reason you couldn't do that third lot was because of the small, um, of the, you know, the narrower house that you'd be forced to live with. So I don't know if that answers your question, I guess. Um, but I will say, yes, some people have talked about that scenario, well, but that it's not just in the context of zero lot line. It's in the context of creating any kind of lot. Do I have enough frontage and lot size to create two lots? Or am I just going to go forward with two structures on a commonly owned parcel and go to site plan review? Um, Well, this has been a really thoughtful discussion and um, I, I really appreciate what everyone's brought to the table. And I see that Bill's hand is raised again. So there, we have a little more discussion to go yet. <laughs> go ahead, Bill. He's muted. I, I just wanted to say, I think the proposal in Porth has some potential it has its limitations, like Carolyn said, in terms of flexibility and stuff, but I think there's probably some way if we could move it to where there is some review by humans uh, who are thinking uh, about how to adapt it to particular situations. I think like that uh, extra two times minimum, you know, if you could move that to a different part or move it to within that place, you could probably find the place where there are the trees or you could, uh, 
you could have a discussion about, well, maybe in this, in this particular uh, property that the houses should just be shorter, but we should still allow this person to build wider because that's, that works for them. So there, there are things that you're giving by allowing the wider homes to meet certain business models, but there are things that you could get back. So this is where I, 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 I do see some potential to the conversation, the way it's, it's going. Alex is, I, I mean, I'm sorry, Alex, uh, Councillor Jarrett's idea of, um, of uh, you know, uh, uh, zero or, or, or uh, 10, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to me because I think 15 feet is too narrow, which we're gonna get with, we have these 35 foot houses, which is potential. 15 feet is too narrow, it's too, still too alley, but 20, I think it, get, it starts to get there. So I, I, I think there's room for more conversation and cre creativity and coming up with something that would, uh, that would uh, may, maybe make a, a lot of us more, all of us happy, maybe not, but it's more of a win-win. So I always like to end things on a positive note and uh, with optimal, optimistic hope for a dialogue and resolution, so. Thank you, Bill. Okay, um, any more discussion on this? We do have a positive recommendation on the floor. Um, Councilor Jarrett. Yeah, I can feel a little uncertain how to proceed because I, I do, I, I kind of feel like we may want more discussion about it, but we're not, we need to do more thinking and more before we're ready to, you know, propose some change um, specifically, but that's how I feel. I mean, I, I definitely want to think, I would plan to think with Carolyn about the, the idea that, you know, where you, you have the, um, you have it pegged to a certain number of feet less than the standard setback is permitted. Um, so I don't know what's appropriate if, if that, if, if a lot of our thinking and thoughts goes into into our recommendation, or if we give a neutral recommendation, say, you know, we just want there to be more thought. So Jim, I'm, I mean, Councillor Nash, um, if uh, you have more experience in, in what these recommendations mean and how they're used, can, what, what are your thoughts about moving forward? I, I, I think that's a fair proposal that, um, that we could ask Councillor Thorpe to change his motion from a, a positive to a neutral recommendation pending. There's more discussion to come um, that this, the intent of this meeting today was just to flesh things out like we just have done and ask some really good questions. And we have stuff to think about. We have a public hearing coming up and we now have uh, an inf more informed public uh, along with more informed counselors who can bring questions to the table there. And so I, I, I think it's fair to send this for, you know, to uh, consider sending this forward with a neutral recommendation, you know, with the idea that there's more discussion and investigation to come. So motion to amend the positive recommendation to a neutral recommendation. And I guess we have to get the okay of the second there. I think I was I was the original seconder and yep. thank you, Councilor Thorpe. I will second the neutral recommendation. Okay. Uh, any more does any discussion on the the recommendation? Councillor Foster. I'd just like to put a little bow on things. Um, so I, I, I appreciate uh, Councillor Jarrett, your um, you know thought process there and sending it forward with a neutral recommendation and, and that's what I'm comfortable doing as well. Um, I appreciate how zero's lot line can allow for that flexibility, can allow for more open space in between houses um, on one side. Um, and I definitely agree that more discussion and thought on this is needed. I'm very hesitant, um, or my concern is related to the question I had brought up earlier of unintentionally, um, you know, moving toward a zoning that would create larger um, and more expensive homes. And I understand, Caroline, what you're saying, that's not necessarily what would happen, um, but I definitely want to spend more time with this and know that there's a public hearing coming up and, and more opportunity for discussion. Thank you. Any more discussion? 
Okay, I think we're ready to do a, a vote on this. Laura, can you do a roll call on a neutral recommendation? Sure, Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Excellent. And I, I wanna th thank everybody who showed up today to be part of this um, discussion. I, it really enhanced things um, and that you can see how things work at a committee rather than a council meeting, that this is, this is a great way for the public to be involved. Um, and, um, and I also wanna thank Carolyn, especially for being here today and so thoughtfully answering questions here. So, um, Councillor uh, Jarrett. I'd like to request a five minute recess. Okay, we got a five minute recess. Okay, uh, we'll be back at 6.46. I don't know if I'm going anywhere. No. <laughs> uh, well, I was hoping for seven. I don't know if it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Well, there's no one here from the public to speak. Oh, maybe there is. Yeah, I think Kim is here. Yeah. And I actually see in Louise Smallin, too. But they oh, must okay, be. Yeah. They, you would think, well, I would think they would be at the Municipal Internet Forum has begun. So maybe they're participating in two Zoom meetings. <laughs> you know, they can actually do that. They, you know, they have. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Hmm. Well, you know what? I think I'm gonna take advantage of this real quick here. Yeah, I should get some water. So uh, Car so Carolyn, you're a runner. Is that right? Yeah. You let like, you run? Yeah. I'm jealous. Okay. Run bike. <laughs> <clears throat> but I obviously not today. <laughs> uh, well, you, know, um, I, you know, we'll see how long this goes. All right. It would be great. I do. I'm supposed to do a pickup at 730. So it'd be great. Oh, OK. Well, you know what? Why don't we do this? You know, we'll, we'll do the technical stuff 
it first and then we you know if you need to run you can run okay that'd be great yeah thanks carolyn you did the boston marathon didn't you or was that just your husband <laughs> and we were training for it um oh i yeah some things blew up <laughs> oh, oh not literally not literally like body <laughs> We, it was before that happened. <laughs> that was back when I first started working for the planning department yeah. in 2001, I want to say. 2000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <sighs> that takes up too much time then now. <laughs> no kidding. I did a half. I've never done a full, but maybe if I'd started running earlier in my life. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Pads are much more run. manageable. Like in a loose sense of the word, yes, but loosely. I guess it's you know. a requirement almost for this to be part of council and city government. You got to jog a little or something. Is that right, Councillor Thorpe? It is. <laughs> you need a stress relief, right? <laughs> in some way. We do. <laughs> and Laura, you do half marathons, right? Well, I haven't done that in the past eight years. <laughs> Oh, okay. well, I did my first at age 50, though, but um, and one a couple of years after that, but not since then. Wow. I don't want to get injured in training, so yeah. it's like keep, keep it to short distances. All right, I see it's 646. We've had our little athletics update. And now, um, all right, let's uh, let's head back into the meeting here. Um, okay. Item number seven, update on regulations of wireless communications facilities. Uh, we have Carolyn here. She's going to help us uh, try to interpret these ordinances from Burlington, Mass. Um, and I'm going to put Councillor Foster on the spot here. She looks like she's ready to go. Are you ready to be put on the spot? I, I anticipated being put on the spot. Okay. Nash, All right. You're so. on the spot. Go. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Carolyn, thank you for including this agenda item in tonight's meeting as well. I appreciate that. Um, you know, and, and just the, the sort of why I asked for this to be on the agenda is that I've, I've certainly been hearing um, concerns uh, from folks in the community, including a, a couple of constituents um, regarding the installation of small cell wireless um, and looking into you know what our options are, and I understand that we we can't regulate them for health or environmental reasons. But sort of as I was receiving communications, also um, other counselors were reaching out to me saying, "Hey, do you want to work on this?" And and we were getting to a point where in order to have a conversation, um, it needed to be in a public meeting so that um, you know counselors could we we could actually talk. For for those who aren't familiar, open meeting law means that more than a quorum of counselors um, or a public body cannot talk about an item that could be on the agenda without violating open meeting law. And that's to make sure that there's transparency in government. And so um, in order to talk with my colleagues on council openly um, about this, I, I uh, asked Councilor Nash about putting it on tonight's agenda. Um, and a couple of thoughts, uh, you know, that, that seem to be worth reconsidering, worth considering how we can incorporate them. One, Carolyn, and I'm sorry, I didn't think to ask you this ahead of time, but um, maybe I'll ask you my question first and then talk for a couple more minutes to, to give your hamster wheel a minute. Um, but one question is regarding um, how many applications for small cell facilities there are here in Northampton. Um, that's, that's information that, you know, unfortunately once council passed the ordinance and then there's a permitting process, we no longer have that information. So if you happen to know, um, that would be great. The other thing, just looking at, you know, is there more that we could do in our ordinance? Could we look at um, potential for setbacks from residences? And that's, uh, you know, aesthetics, fall zone, that type of thing. Um, you know, is there a possibility to in incorporate a public hearing um, when small cell facilities are proposed, um, as well as, as taking a look at, um, you know, can, a part of the, the process include monitoring um, for radiation to make sure that it's within limits. And, and please, if there's other ideas that we should be incorporating, but those are the three that have been kind of percolating um, in my mind as well. Um, so with that, um, 
I think I'm willing to take myself off the hot seat um, and we can go from there. Yeah, oh, I think you put Carolyn in the hot seat. So there you go, Carolyn. Thank you so Sorry, much. Sorry, Carolyn. <laughs> Do you want a minute to take a jog or no? <laughs> <laughs> I need longer than that. <laughs> um, so uh, first of all, we haven't had any applications since council adopted the update um, a year ago. Um, prior to that, um, and I will say just to back up, I, I'm going to refer to small cells as the basically antennas that um, go um, closer to street level. They're not on monopoles or, or tall poles that are spread out, you know, miles apart, but they're to fill in gaps in between those poles. And they're typically along the street or in the right of way um, and are, are at different frequencies than the large monopoles. Um, but um, prior to the council vote, and I haven't gone back to tabulate exactly the number, but um, I think maybe seven total. Um, and these are not 5G. Nobody really has 5G. Um, even a little bit in Boston, there's 5G, but that, but not even all of Boston's covered. So it's, um, they're just sort of uh, essentially gap fillers between the poles. Um, uh, so um, I think that um, because they're filling in gaps in their service, um, they necessarily need, are in areas where there's greater population. Um, I'm not sure what a setback from a residence would um, be intended to do. I know you've mentioned aesthetics or, um, um, I'm not sure whether um, what other things would be considered, but we've built in us to the existing regulations um, aesthetic, um, you know, a, a, a priority order of aesthetics and how we want these to be camouflaged anyway, so it doesn't or or masked, um, shrouded in um, in equipment that. Um, um, provides that sort of additional um, aesthetic quality if, if you, there can be one for such things. Um, so that's already built in, um, but I, I don't believe we have the ability to say hard and fast, it has to be X feet from a residence. Um, even um, in the Burlington example that's been pushed, floated around, um, it just says special permit, but it doesn't say what that special permit is. It just sends it through a regular special permit process. So it's not clear what the purpose of that would be. Um, but I think, and then in terms of the question about public hearing, the whole, the reason why we went through this review a year ago was to say, look, we the city has to approve these things or else the FCC would approve it for us. Um, and so it doesn't make sense to have a public hearing to set up um, a, a situation in which the public might be notified and think that they have a role in dictating whether something can be approved or not, when in fact they can't really do that. So instead, the idea was to set up very specific criteria that have to be met and that that can be an administrative review. So in that process, we have draft criteria right now. The way the ordinance has been established is that there are um, uh, the permit. A permit goes to DPW for these items because primarily they're going to be within the right of way. So um, that's why the council adopted it as a city council review. Um, the draft um, regulations set up an application process for identifying whether it's a renewal. Uh, the other thing is there's a fee structure on an annual basis for these um, providers to um, pay a fee every year. So at that time, we can review um, what the radio frequency is. Um, the application has, um, the draft application has, um, a series of questions and check boxes, you know, how many installations are you applying for? What was the, you know, are you still meeting the maximum approved FCC 
um, FCC radio frequency? Um, are there any other changes? Um, so in that way, we would be asking for that data on an annual basis. Um, and then, of course, for new applications, um, you know, the uh, requirements that have always been there to um, show the need, where what is the gap that's being filled, um, the um, masking or shrouding mechanism, um, the, the type of equipment, the weight of equipment, where it's going to be located, all those details um, that we would want to know for any piece of physical equipment that's going within the right of way. And so um, I think that those um, specifications have been um, very clearly laid out. DPW hasn't yet incorporated them or finished reviewing. So I can't tell you what exactly will be the final um, outcome. It's just, Basically, COVID put every put a wrench in everything and put everything on the back burner. So that's why we don't have them adopt. We have only draft um, stipulations for design and the permit conditions and things like that. Hmm. Councillor Foster. I could ask two follow up questions then, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. um, so who is it the carrier that's responsible for doing the testing on yep. radio frequency? Well, the carrier oh. hires an engineer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it is a, a third party, but it's, hi it's hired by right. the carrier. Right. Okay. And does the city get a copy of that? Oh yeah, they're required to submit that. Yep. Okay, all right. And then I guess the other piece of, and I understand what you're saying about, um, a public hearing would set up a process where there was an idea that there could be a yes or no decision. So maybe not that, um, but one request that I've heard is about public notice that um, people may or may not living nearby wouldn't get notification that was something, something was being installed um, near their home. Is that something that it wouldn't unduly hold up the process, but would also, you know, let people know if something is going to be installed near their home. Is, is that something that, that you've seen incorporated in other communities or has that been a dis? Well, typically that's what, uh, you know, notification goes out when there's a public hearing process, but not when there's an administrative review of something. And um, so I, um, I don't think it makes sense to set up or create an arbitrary distance for where and who gets notified of these things. I mean, one of the um, one of the things that we've been trying to do citywide is to adopt a system, a permitting system that's easily accessible to the public um, for all permits. I mean, from the planning office's side, we have a public um, link to all the permits that the boards that we staff issue. Um, the building department has a link to the building permits that are issued. The same thing I think would be beneficial um, as we transition and try to push more and, and COVID I think really highlighted the fact that we really are far behind in um, publicly accessible documents from each department. Um, but I think that's really the place where it would it should live um, so that any permit that any department issues is publicly accessible um, from anyone at any time. Um, so, you know, I think the ability for someone to go on and say, oh, I wanna see how many small cells have been approved by DPW, they can just go on the webpage anytime and do that and, and find it. Um, and I think that's a much better way of providing information for the public because then we're not presuming who wants to know and who doesn't want to know. Um, and also given that it's an administrative review, um, uh, it's not arbitrarily you know, creating a notification system that we don't do for any other permit that's ever issued by the city.
I noticed that um, Kim W has a question. So actually, I, I had a couple of questions and comments. So first of all, thanks for um, having an open meeting and discussion. And Carolyn, thank you for um, all the information that you have given me in the past. So I'm actually learning some new information today that I didn't realize. And that was that you had actually included in the permitting process requirement that they let you know which frequencies they are transmitting and what they're actually putting up. So um, I'm wondering if I can get a copy of that, all that information from you about these specifics that I'm actually quite interested in knowing about. If you could email those to me, that would be really helpful. Um, so I, I, one of the things, um, it, is this just for questions right now or? Um, it's for questions, discussion. Carolyn is going to be popping out of here probably within the next five minutes or so. Yeah, so yeah. go for it, Kim. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I understand um, the bind that the, um, the city is in and city council with uh, writing ordinances for this kind of thing because of the um, FCC regulations, which are rather onerous. Um, I think that it is something that um, the city has been led to believe that we don't have a lot of influence on when we actually have more influence on this than we think we might because one of the things that we can do is protect our property values. And I'm gonna give you a specific instance of one of the things that has happened right now in the Riverside neighborhood where I was measuring the frequencies and the um, power output from these um, cell antennas. And I was speaking to the neighbors when I was there. And I just was asking, hey, how's it going? Have you noticed any problems since this has been up? And most people said, no, no problem. Well, one person came out of their house and said, we're selling our house. This is a young um, person who has been very healthy. They have children and they are, have developed uh, symptoms typical of microwave illness. Now, I know that we cannot consider this as part of the reason to where we're placing these antennas. I understand that. But I said to her, oh, would you be willing to come speak to city council about this? And she said, no, I can't be public about this because if I do that, I won't be able to sell my house. I'm concerned what that will do to my property and my ability to sell the house. So right there in Northampton is a property value issue due to a cell antenna in a neighborhood close to a number of homes. We have the ability to protect our property values and the way we can do that is with setbacks. There is nothing in the FCC regulations that says that we cannot do that. Shelburne has 1500 foot setbacks. Burlington has a special permit for 200 foot setbacks. Other cities around the country have various setbacks of various types, 300 feet, so on and so forth. And um, as people start to realize what's going on with these things, they're not gonna wanna buy homes near these small SL antennas. And it's definitely gonna affect people's property values. And as Carolyn said, there's a new development coming up. People just bought those homes there but you'll see other places where people have more knowledge of this and they, they either have more trouble selling their home or have to sell their home at a lesser value. I sent um, links to the real estate studies, multiple real estate studies that show that there is not uncommonly a 20% loss of value with a home that is right next to one of these cell antennas. And we can take that into account. And I think we should take that into account. When Verizon comes and says, we have a gap in our service and we need to put a small cell antenna close to JFK and we're gonna park it right between the Ellery and the house next door, which is about two and a half, um, 2.5 tenths of a mile from JFK. We can look at that and we can say, it's gonna affect the property value of that home that they're parked that thing next to. It's about 90 feet from that home. There's no reason that they couldn't have put that thing at Child's Park, which would have been closer to JFK. The, all they have to do is run their broadband cable 
up to that po phone pole or utility pole at um, Child's Park and put their antenna there and it's not right in front of somebody's house. Same thing with this, this antenna on Spring Grove, right by people's homes, people, people's children playing right underneath that antenna. That was for, um, for JFK. Why couldn't they put that at Look Park? It's not that much farther away. They can get the same broadcasting distance and put it in a park and not right in somebody's home. So some of these things that we are um, allowing the telecom companies to make the decisions about, which maybe we could have a little more input about. And we have just finished putting out that survey for municipal broadband. Municipal broadband is definitely faster. It's more secure. People can't hack into it the way they can hack into the, um, the Wi-Fi uh, network. And it's also way more energy efficient. And since we've just passed the new um, energy resolution, this is something to take into account. Can we hardwire JFK? Can we hardwire the high school? Can we hardwire, you know, um, the Ryan Road School? Can we hardwire our schools so that we don't need these cell antennas to be giving all of these schools um, Wi-Fi signals to, to, for the students to learn. So I think there are just more different ways of looking at this. One of the reasons that we could consider notifying people over a larger area for these is simply because it's a slightly different thing than just something that you're looking at. These things broadcast microwave frequencies and they broadcast them over a fairly large area. I think that there are people that are concerned about this and would want to know if that's going to be affecting their home value. And if you're within say 300 feet of one of these things, it might be reasonable for people to know that one of these things is going up in their neighborhood. One of the things I found when I was talking to the neighbors is that they had no idea that a cell antenna was going up. Um, I think that when the, when the postcards say um, telecommunications equipment on a utility pole in your neighborhood, it doesn't mean to them that this is going to be a, a cell antenna that's broadcasting microwave radio frequencies. And I think that we have to be very specific when we're telling people what's happening so that they can make a reasonable decision like, oh, this is something that either I like it, I want this stuff in my neighborhood, it's great, or oh, I'm concerned about this, this might affect something, you know, my family's ability to live here or my ability to sell my house. I think we should be very much um, more open with what's happening in our process to let people in the neighborhoods know what's going on. Oh, so Kim. I, I just, I'm going to interrupt you real quick because I'd like Carolyn to be able to weigh in before she bolts out the door to go do some family time. And um, so Carolyn, you get the floor and then we'll keep talking once Carolyn hops out of here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've gotten the information from Kim about the concern about property values. I, I think it's a hard thing to latch on to definitively to, um, in particular areas, I know, I mean, she did send me those studies. I think that um, um, I, I, I don't um, know that we have the ability to determine that um, how much, if any, property value is changed because of someone's concern that it might affect their ability to sell. Um, I will also say that, you know, I did, I actually looked at the, a little bit into Shelburne and Shelburne has several cell towers within 1500 feet um, of homes. And I don't, um, I don't know if, you know, they have that on the books, but it, they can't really enforce it um, or what the situation is. It would be interesting to see what the, the communities that have these regulations on the books and whether or not they're actually either enforcing them or they were 
told they couldn't enforce them or maybe they were on the books after some of these systems were installed. Um, but it also could be the case that, you know, communities write regulations and then when these, the providers come in that there's enough pushback that the community that's reviewing them can't actually enforce um, that. I don't know. Um, uh, so I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I don't have, um, as far as, as far as the city's regulations go, I think it probably makes, um, it may make sense to evaluate what authority the city has to regulate based on property values. I haven't heard that, um, that used in particular, and it would be, um, I mean, certainly city council could um, look at that kind of thing. I still think in terms of notice that because it's not a public um, hearing process that we wouldn't be notifying people. But again, I think that we really should be bolstering um, the, uh, the um, our public uh, access to all permits that are granted. And then just one final thing. Um, we do when there are gap analysis is submitted there sometimes is the um i don't know enough about the technology to know you know if providers can just um leave one spot and go to another spot um and and get the same coverage um I, that's certainly not what we've seen on the face of it um but any of these parks are also close to residential structures as well so there may be a balance too, you know, do you want it at this house location or someone else's house location? Um, but that's, you know, that obviously is, could be looked at on an individual basis. Um, but I, otherwise I don't really have anything else unless you have questions related to that. Um, and we, again, we're not quite finished um, with the language, but as soon as it's available we can shoot it out to counselors and anybody else but i haven't heard back from um uh dpw yet thank you carolyn uh well i i did cut kim off and kim do you want to you were on a roll or were you near to done did it, was there something else you wanted to add I could take a break and see if other people have comments and questions, but I'm on a roll, yes. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, Councilor Jarrett has a question. Great, so um, I spoke with attorney, see, this is actually a, it's somewhat of a response to Carolyn. Um, so I spoke with attorney Seawald and um, his opinion was that, you know, we can try to regulate the distance from homes and schools. Um, for these, these permitted, you know, aesthetic or visual impact, um, fall zones, property values, but that those could be overruled by coverage needs. Um, but my thought was that it seemed better to attempt to regulate it because if it is possible while still providing coverage, then we will have these setbacks and the burden would be on the companies to prove that they have to be, that they have to, you know, they have to show the maps that, that say we have to be in this zone. Um, rather than taking the easier route, which might be to be a little further away from homes. Um, so that was, that was the information that, that, that I got, that it's not going to hurt us to try, um, but we might be overruled. Thank you. Um, and Anne Louise. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, I guess um, for me, it's really a question of health. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there's certainly proofs that um, these can be detrimental to, uh, to people's health, uh, especially to children and um, and so on. And um, I, I just want to voice my desire that if ever more permits are required, that uh, we should have a review by the Board of Health and, and a serious review. 
uh, before, um, um, basically, because I think that, uh, well, I don't know, all right, but it seems to me that a, a serious review by the Board of Health uh, would be necessary before uh, before proceeding with even discussing the possibility of a permit. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I, I need to- Carolyn wants to respond, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I do need to sign off and I don't know if Councillor Foster was gonna talk about this, but unfortunately, even though there's been a lot of discussion about health, um, we can't have a review of these based on their health impacts. And that's very clear in the regulation. So even though I know that's the, probably the biggest issue and, and, mm -hmm. and concern that um, that, uh, that has been clarified precisely that we don't have the jurisdiction over that. Thank so. you. And thanks, I'm sorry, um, but obviously anybody has questions about this as we move forward, you can email or what have you. Thank you for coming tonight, Carolyn, and we'll all be out on the road soon. We'll probably be passing you as you run, so. Sounds good, thanks. <laughs> Bye. Um, Thank you, Carolyn, really appreciate it. Okay, uh, Councillor Foster, I think you were next up. Uh, Carolyn said what I was going to say, which is um, that the guidance we've received uh, from Attorney Seawald uh, from the FCC is that um, unfortunately, we can't regulate these based on health and environmental considerations, which is why I think you see us, or not which is why, but if we're going to regulate them, we need to be looking at other factors, including um, you know, some of the, some of the other things that, that we brought up this evening. Mm -hmm. We have no right to review. And by that, I mean delay. Okay. Not based on health, which is everybody's concern. Then uh, let's review for value of our property. Can I just make one comment on that? Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, so the FCC regulation is very clear that environment is not allowed to be taken into account. They say nothing about health. Where this health came in was in several lawsuits. Several judges ruled that um, they couldn't prevent anybody from putting up one of these things based on health. That is all going through the courts right now, and we're going to see some changes. But for now, we can't take it into account. But I just wanted to say that the original FCC regulation is environment. It doesn't mention health at all. Interesting. So we don't have any legislation before us tonight related to this, we've had a discussion about possible directions to go in. And um, I suspect that um, some of the counselors in the room are gonna be thinking about where they might be able to go with that based on this discussion. Um, is there anything else we wanna say before we wrap this topic up? Go ahead, Kim. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that I have been doing is trying to look through the regulations that are on the books in a lot of different cities and try to come up with the ones that seem to make the most sense for Northampton. Um, and I realize that all of these need to go through city council and, you know, Carolyn needs to take a look at them. But I guess uh, I'd like to know kind of where to present those, who to present those to, like, where should I share this information so that you all can take a look at it? That's a great question. I, I, so in terms of getting the process going in terms of any future legislation, it can either come from the mayor or it can come from uh, counselors. And right now you have the ear of four counselors in this room and definitely the ear of 
Councillor Foster who brought this all to our attention. And that, um, so I, you know, my suggestion is that, you know, you keep talking with us and I am, you know, if you have more information to provide in the future, I'm happy to consider putting um, uh, this topic on a future agenda. Um, and so we can, you know, explore ways forward. I, I, the, the conundrum here is everybody's concerned about health and, you know, that that's the one place that we, we seem, you know, according to uh, Attorney Seawald, where we can't go. So, um, you know, people oppose housing because there's a wetland, you know, and we've heard those discussions. And um, so, uh, you know, we're, people are looking, people look for ways to oppose things. And, um, and that, um, anyway, um, there's more work to be done here. <laughs> There is, and I understand that Carolyn wasn't uh, maybe uh, blown away by the real estate studies that I sent, but um, I hope you all got a chance to look at the letters because Anne Louise sent um, uh, the letter to everybody and the real estate studies are actually really clear. Um, they are statistically done studies by appraisers. So it's not just looking at this house in this neighborhood had a cell antenna in front of it and lost a value. This is looking at large areas, many homes, and it's done in many areas. So this is not just a something that's, um, oh, well, we have to make sure that, you know, we have can show that this home in Northampton lost value because of the cell antenna. No, these are these are nationwide and even international studies that show that cell antennas cause the loss of property values. In fact, even the, um, the HUD has a regulation that says that appraisers need to consider if there is a cell antenna near the property. And there's only one reason to consider that, and that's because of property value. Otherwise, HUD would not mention that in their regulations. So there's, there's plenty of precedent for using property values to help us protect ourselves. unless they're actually concerned about health <laughs> and don't have to say it. Councillor Jarrett. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in continuing to work on this. Uh, thank you, Kim, for all that you've sent us. The challenge for me is, is how do we take all this information and distill it down to a proposed uh, change to the ordinance and what uh, you know? What will, what is right for us? What is likely to, to move forward to not be so overly broad that it raises too many concerns? Uh, so, um, you know, I, I welcome continuing to to talk about this and think that the uh, the setback, um, and I'm not, but I don't know what what number is a, is is the right number for a proposed setback, another thing to consider, um, gives us that potential power to, to regulate, uh, even if it might be over, overridden. But um, it would, it, you know, if we don't, then we don't have that power at all. So um, we'd love to work, keep working with folks on this. That's great. So just to let you know, Burlington did pass their ordinance and Verizon pulled out of trying to put their cell antennas in Burlington after they passed that ordinance. And it was due to a combination of the, um, the provisions requiring the setbacks. And it was also due to the provisions that they had to inspect those facilities on a yearly basis and prove that they were still safe um, and pay a fee. So there are a number of things that can be done to help us to um, protect ourselves and uh, and I and I still think that community wide broadband is one of the best ways to go too so I hope uh, right. and I, I hope wonder if that forum is still going on <laughs> so yeah, and even at the federal level uh, you know the uh, uh, I guess development of the broadband uh, is being discussed and naturally nothing is is in and is is being regulated yet, but I think that the city of Northampton should also 
be looking at possibilities for that and possibilities <coughs> uh, down the line to um, um, to receive a federal fund to uh, expand broadband. I mean, in other words, it's not it's not a uh, it's, it, it is not a law now, but it is certainly something that is being discussed at the federal level to to widen, largely widen broadband. So I'm hoping that the city of Northampton would take advantage of that if if uh, if that comes to be the law of the land. Well, Anne Louise, have you filled out your survey? Uh, for municipal broadband yet. I think everybody got sent that. I, I received one the other day. You can also go on the city website and fill that out. Uh, we've contracted with a consultant who is gathering information to see, to test the waters, to see how interested folks are in that. And, um, and also Councillor Sharon, Councillor Dwight are in that other forum. Uh, they may still be there discussing um, this particular issue. Uh, Councillor Dwight, this has been a big thing for him for many, many years that um, he, he was a uh, proponent of our public access TV and he sees this as an, ex you know, the internet and internet access as an extension of, you know, his advocacy over the years. So um, yeah, that uh, I, I think the city's very interested in exploring that. Okay. So. Yeah, and I, I will I will do so, and uh, I have done not done it, but I will do so, and I will also certainly invite others to do it. Yeah, great. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's an exciting idea, and especially when we can build in equity as well. That mm -hmm. um, we that you know how many people during this you know pandemic have been cut off from uh, access to the to this. <laughs> forms just like this because they don't have you know they don't have comcast as their provider mm -hmm. um so yeah yeah all right this is this is where Councillor nash gets forceful and um and starts to bring things steer things to um <laughs> an end and so this has been a great discussion uh you know we we, we all commit to continuing this a discussion around um, uh, small uh, cell towers, and, um, and but I'd like to move on to the next few items on our agenda. And with those next few items, I'm actually going to propose that we once again table these discussions again until our next meeting, because uh, I know that everybody was hoping we'd be done by seven o'clock, but the discussion stayed pretty robust the whole time especially thanks to the members of the public who showed up. So if we get through item eight, if we table that, that brings us to new business. Is there any new business? Well, if there's no business that, no new business, that brings us to number 10, which is adjourn. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Okay. Uh, there's no discussion on adjourning. Laura, could we get a roll call? Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Very productive.